Hi, and welcome to this run through of the biological processes paper, which I've made using the advanced information uh, for what's going to be on the exam in 2022. So if you're in my class, you've done this paper already, we're going to, we're going to mark it, we're going to write in all the answers, and then we're going to evaluate how we did in the different areas that can be assessed. If you're watching this and you're not in my class, um, I'm going to send the link to the paper underneath in the description. So I recommend do the paper first and then come back to this video to see how you did to evaluate it and to plan your next steps for revision. And once again, this paper I've made using past questions from a range of different years, um, and it's all based on what the exam would have told us is coming up. So this pr pretty much could be quite close to what you'll get uh, this year in 2022. Let's get going. Okay, so the first 15 marks in this um, multiple choice, I've included a lot of questions from um, the modules that aren't majorly assessed, okay? So you do need to know everything especially for one markers. So let's get into that. Question one shows part of a conjugated protein. So conjugated protein is one which contains a prosthetic group. So this is really just looking at your definition of what you of what this is. So the answer is A, it's a prosthetic group. This, by the way, is heme. It's found in cytochromes and also in hemoglobin and in myoglobin as well. Two, which of the following is not uh, a role of an intracellular, intracellular, okay, so this is tricky, intracellular, so that means inside the cell, so this is really testing, did you spot this, or did you just read it as intercellular by mistake, so it's not cell-to-cell -cell signaling, not that, because that would, the membrane on the outside would be cell-to-cell -cell signaling, this is correct, this is correct, and this is also correct, so the answer is A for that one. Question three, after being mixed with iodine, which of the following should show a blue-black color? So this is testing your knowledge of food tests. So iodine turns blue-black in the presence of starch. So which things have starch? Potato tuber cells, yes, they definitely would. Those are cells that store starch underground. Erythrocytes, that's a red blood cell. That's animal, so that would not be it. Sieve tube elements, now this, I think when in my class, this caused a few people a bit of Question, they were questioning themselves, but the sieve tube elements, those are the phloem cells, and they transport mainly sucrose, and that sucrose is then converted into starch and stored once it gets to the potato cells. Neutrophils, again, that's animal, so that wouldn't be the case. So the answer is A. Moving on down. Down to four. Three types of microscope are listed below. Um, select the one that shows the correct use for each type of microscope. Okay, so light microscope is the best, best ones here are whole cells and tissues. What I'm doing is I'm scanning down this column and I see object at a certain depth and I immediately know that is the laser scanning uh, confocal. Uh, so actually we can just go across here. Laser scanning confocal is an object at a certain depth within a cell. Um, I'll throw in a little image here of kind of how that works and basically the lasers can focus their light on a certain plane within the cell. So you kind of, you get to look at just one two dimensional plane within a larger block of cells or tissue without actually slicing it because the lasers can be focused very exactly. Um, so that's how it works. Transmission electron microscope gives us enough resolution to see organelles in the inside of the cell. So the answer here is D. Which of the following statements describes an organelle which is not which is not membrane bound? Okay, well, contains Christi. This is a mitochondria, and that is that is a membrane bound organelle. So it's not that one. Modifies and packages proteins. That's the Golgi, and that oops, I can't spell. That has got membranes around it, so it's not that one. Contains digestive enzymes. That's lys lysosome. Um, and is made of RNA and protein, that would be ribosome. So the only one that doesn't have a membrane around it is D, the ribosome. Six. The diagram below shows the arrangement of chromosomes in a cell during metaphase two. Okay, so spot the two there. Metaphase two, that is in meiosis. The second division of meiosis. So which letter indicates a homologous pair of chromosomes? The homologous pair 
is like a chromosome from your mother and your father. You have like two chromosome threes. One of those chromosome threes is from your mum, and one of those chromosome threes is from your dad, a homologous pair. So they should be the same size. So that's an easy way of doing it. We're just looking for the letters where they're the same size. So this is a pair, and you know this is a pair. So which, which letter is the correct one? Pointing to the pair, it is A. A is pointing to the pair. So they are actually in two separate cells because by, by meiosis 2, we've already divided once. So that they are actually in two separate cells because we have two divisions. That may have thrown you. Moving on. Seven. DNA polymerase cataly catalyzes the formation of phosphodiester bonds during DNA replication. Which of the statements, A to D, will not affect the rate of phosphodiester bond formation? So we're talking about an enzyme that makes bonds, and we're talking about the rate of the enzyme, okay? So temperature will affect the rate. The length of the DNA molecule will not affect the rate. The pH will, avail will affect the rate, and the free nucleotide will affect the rate, because free nucleotide availability is basically the substrate, okay? How much substrate? So substrate affects enzyme rate, pH affects enzyme rate, temperature affects enzyme rate. The length of the DNA molecule, not really, because remember, if you know if this is a long DNA molecule, just kind of draw it very quickly, and you know we've got the enzyme here, blob, just moving along um, this way. We're really thinking about the rate that it moves along. So that's the rate of phosphodiester bond formation. We're not actually thinking about like how far it will go, which is kind of the length of the DNA molecule. Do you understand? So the answer is. <clears throat> the diagram below shows the structure of a plasma membrane or cell surface membrane. Which label indicates the, the component of the membrane that can affect its fluidity? So the main one that, that is regulates membrane fluidity is cholesterol. And therefore you just needed to spot which of these is cholesterol, and the answer is D. So cholesterol is a lipid. It sits in the membrane and it kind of regulates the fluidity. It almost acts, it actually acts as a buffer, keeping it fluid at low temperatures and, and kind of stopping it becoming uh, too fluid at high temperatures. It's almost like a, a fluidity buffer. Nine. Which of the following best describes a microscope with a high resolution? So this is testing your understanding of this. What does resolution mean? So resolution is your ability to distinguish two points, really, to two, two objects as separate. At low resolution, they might blur into one thing, a blurry smudge. But at high resolution, you might actually notice that there's two little dots quite close to each other. So A is basically that. Uh, let's read on and double check. Always we double check. The night strip can view structures that are very small. That's not quite it. That's more magnification. Capable of high magnification. Well, no, that's magnification an inbuilt eyepiece graticle. Well, that's nice, but it would just mean that we could measure things. It doesn't, it doesn't talk about, it's not really to do with resolution. So the answer is A. 10. Animals receive different stimuli from their environment. The synapses can manage multiple stimuli, often resulting in one response. This is summation. Okay, well, what type of summation is it? Can manage multiple stimuli um, at once. So when I hear that multiple stimuli, I think of sort of one, one neuron here kind of getting lots of different stimuli and then kind of making a decision, yes or no, whether to fire or not. So multiple different stimuli, yes or no, whether it's going to fire to twitch a muscle. So I would call that spatial summation. Um, temporal summation might have been tempting, but I think it's this multiple stimuli that implies spatial summation, and that is the right answer. <clears throat> the kidneys of a healthy individual filtered 178 litres per day of fluid. That is a lot, 178 litres of fluid. However, only 1.5 litres of urine is produced. What percentage of the filtrate is reabsorbed? Reabsorbed. Well, let's, let's do an easy way uh, is just to do 1.5 divided by 178 and times that by 100 to make it as a percentage. 
Excuse me whilst I just do that. So that is 84%. What? Sorry, 0.84% uh, is actually uh, passed out, which means 99.2% is reabsorbed. Okay, so I'm just basically I'm doing 100 minus 0.84, and I get this D. 99.2. You might have missed, it would have been easy to do so, this bit. Okay, you might have just gone, oh, percentage, easy, fine, right, do it. But then it actually wants the percentage that is reabsorbed, not the percentage that is passed out of the body as a urine. Question 12. One treatment for thyroid cancer is radioactive iodine. The isotope I131 is used. The thyroid gland absorbs any iodine that enters the body. So the radioactive isotope kills the cancer cells in the thyroid gland. Then uh, the I31 is then excreted. Different body fluids excrete different proportions of I31 as shown in the following graph. So we've got most of it in urine, urine, some in feces, some in sweat, and barely any in the air. Which of the following A to D correctly explains the different proportions um, in each body fluid? Soluble in water, well, I think that's pretty good because it, you know, if it's very soluble in water, it's going to leave in the urine. Able to cross capillary walls is kind of all right as well. Hmm. The kidneys are more efficient at excreting 131 than the lungs. Huh, this is a tricky one because they all are kind of right. I think the answer is A. Am I right? Oh no, I'm not. The answer is C. The kidneys are more efficient at excreting I-131 than the lungs. Is the answer. To be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure why that's the answer given. The examiner's comment says, this question proved challenging for some and required skills in applying knowledge to novel context to choose the most appropriate response. I guess I think they're all kind of right. The examiner says it's this one. I guess that's true. I'm not really sure if that explains. For me, I don't really think that explains it. I think that just states it. It doesn't really give the explanation, but whatever. It's C, says the example. 13. Citrate synthase catalyzes the conversion of oxalacetate into citric acid in the Krebs cycle. It exhibits product inhibition, which is which of the following is the correct description of citrate synthase. So this is in the Krebs cycle. So, um, and we need to kind of really read this information. Okay, so type of respiration involved in. If it's in the Krebs cycle, it's in aerobic respiration, so we can narrow it down to B or C. Uh, where would it be? If it's, ha if it's working in the Krebs cycle, you just need to remember that the Krebs cycle is in the mitochondria. So again, we're in here. Now, the last bit could prove tricky. It says it exhibits product inhibition. So this is um, kind of combining knowledge about respiration with knowledge you looked at about enzymes in module two. So end product inhibition is where the product of an enzyme reaction kind of slows it down. So the product here is citric acid because oxaloacetate is converted into citric acid. So this is this is the answer here. So the answer is B. Moving on down to 14. Let's zoom out a little bit. Right. Okay, so this is exercise starting and heat flow through the skin. I'm going to kind of just go over it here so we can kind of see it a bit more clearly. Right, what's that? Which row gives the best explanation of the stages R, S, and T? Uh, let's highlight this. So R, S, and T. All right, so R, blood directed away from the skin to avoid excess heat loss. I mean, I don't really think so. Blood directs away from the skin and towards muscles to supply more oxygen for respiration. Blood directed away from skin to avoid excess. Okay, so we have to choose between this. Is it about heat loss or is it about respiration? I think it's B or C because 
when once exercise starts, immediately blood is diverted towards muscles, right? That's pretty rapid. Um, it's not once exercise starts, suddenly the body is worried about cooling down all of a sudden. That doesn't make sense. So we can already go to B and D. At S, now heat flow is, uh, is a lot higher. So blood is going to be diverted towards the skin to release excess heat. Yeah, so this is, this is the one, B. Uh, it's not, we don't get, we're not um, lizards. Humans don't gain heat from the environment. We don't bask in the sun, but well, I mean, we do sunbathe, but it's not to raise our body temperature. Um, and then T, let's just double check this makes sense. Balance achieved between heat loss and excess created in the muscles. Yeah, pretty much, that's, that's pretty good. Like it's not, um, you know, it's kind of more, it's fairly consistent heat flow. So yeah, B is correct. And that is the right answer. All right, last multiple choice one. Oh, this was tricky. Uh, actually, when I was marking my students' papers, I marked this wrong, and then I had to mark it again because I missed a tiny little bit of, um, tiny little bit of the question. These are statements about the liver. Number one, number two, number three. Stores bile in the gallbladder, contains sinusoids, receive blood from gut and heart. Which of these statements relate to? This is the bit I missed. The exocrine function of the liver. So remember that exocrine glands secrete something into a duct, which then exits the body. So all these statements about the liver are true. This is true, this is true, this is true. But which ones are about specifically the exocrine function? And it is only the one about bile, okay? Because bile uh, is, a, is an exocrine product. So it's only one, so the answer is D, okay? It's really your attention to detail that you spot that word exocrine there and you know the difference between exocrine and endocrine okay so that's the multiple choice um obviously didn't have time to kind of or didn't have enough questions to really fully cover the whole syllabus it's only 15 marks but it just gives you a little feel for um are there areas of the syllabus that you were shaky on i really, really think that you need to know your foundations in the biology module module two very well um, for, for, for all the papers, even though if it doesn't specifically say it's coming up in the uh, advanced information, it could be tested on multiple choice and it, and it could come up within other questions. Okay, so module two is very important. Okay, let's get into question 16 now. Athletic sprinters require large amounts of energy in short periods of time. Many elite sprinters can run a 100 meters race in under 10 seconds. Under normal conditions, exercise requires an increased rate of breathing, but it has been observed that some of the best sprinters only take one breath at the start of the race and do not inhale again until the end of the race. How is this basically possible? How can these sprinters expend so much energy without needing to carry out aerobic respiration? Well, there's a few things here. First of all, they, uh, they already have oxygen uh, in lungs and in blood. So perhaps that is sufficient for them to, to kind of use that oxygen that's already in their body for 10 seconds. The second thing is that they may already have ATP in cells and muscles already already there ready to be burned the third thing is they can do anaerobic respiration now you have to actually say that they can um, tolerate a high level of lactic acid I'll show you your mark scheme in a second but you, you couldn't just get it for saying anaerobic respiration now the fourth point was uh, an error on my part um, this is in the specification, but I don't believe it's in our textbook, so I think I forgot to include it. And it is this the topic of this thing called creatine. Now, creatine is a molecule that exists in muscle cells, in muscle fibers, and it acts as a kind of ATP buffer. So when, when muscles are not very active, respiration in the mitochondria generates ATP, and that ATP, here it is, is then used to phosphorylate creatine to make phosphocreatine, that's phosphocreatine there, and then ADP. So we have a store, a buildup of phosphocreatine when the muscles are not working that much. Then when the muscles get working very quickly, for example in a sprint, the phosphocreatine can um, be broken down and that phosphate group is basically, this phosphate group here, is basically re-added onto ADP and we go this way and ATP is regenerated, okay? So um, that is something extra that we didn't talk about in depth. So 
make some notes on that or just try and remember that creatine phosphocreatine and then phosphocreatine back into creatine when the muscles need more ATP okay moving on okay a response affected by plant hormones is phototropism a student completed an investigation into phototropism in crest seeds here was the method used uh, 50 crest seeds on a sterile paper towel in a petri dish water with some distilled water um, set one is placed in a box to prevent light shining so set one is like a dark box um, in a box set one set two is light from above only so kind of directly above and set three is light from the right hand side only all sets are kept at the same temperature 25C, and then after 72 hours, um, you remove 20 of the seedlings from each set and count how many have bent. So the question asks for limitations. Limitation one, explanation improvement. Limitation two, explanation and improvement. So I'll show you the mark scheme here in a second, but I'll just uh, kind of jump in with some quick observations. So first of all, um, it's it's this kind of remove 20 of the seedlings okay so 20 of the seedlings are removed 50 were placed on the dish how do you choose these is this is this random is it the ones that you like the look of that's very biased so um, it might affect the results if you're selectively choosing the ones that you think have bent a lot so that's a limitation an explanation I've kind of explained it it would affect the results and improvement might be to use a random number generator to select them, or potentially maybe only do 20 crest seedlings on a paper towel and then take all of them out and count them. Um, another thing is count how many have bent. Is that very scientific? Like, you know, 10 of them have bent out of 20? How about measuring the bent, quantifying it somehow? Uh, let's get some actual um, quantitative data as opposed to qualitative data. Maybe we could use a little, uh, what's it called, a protractor to measure the degree of bend for each seedling uh, to get an average, perhaps. Okay, so let's look at the mark scheme there. First of all, I realize I haven't shown you the mark scheme for that um, sprinter question. So the sprinter question is there, question 16. Pause and have a look if you want to look at that again. Remember what I said about high levels of lactate or high levels of lactic acid would be okay for this, lactate. And then moving on to 17, this is the phototropism. The way the mark scheme is arranged are, first of all, let's, well, let's look at each one in turn. This one is all about light. I forgot to mention this, it's obvious. Light intensity, brightness is not controlled. The size of the hole in the box is not specified. How do we know that this, the holes in three different cups or boxes are not the, uh, aren't the same size? If one was bigger and was smaller, that would not be fair. Um, and also, we don't really know about the color of the light, um, the wavelength of the light, so that's something down here as well. It says allow wavelength or color instead of intensity throughout. So if we talked about the wavelength of light instead of, instead of the light intensity, that's also a limitation. So that first limitation is all about light, limitation, uh, then there's the explanation is L2, and the suggestion of how to improve it is L3. Let's look at the next limitation. Again, the mark scheme is arranged as S1, S2, S3. So the selection of seedlings, the fact that it's a limitation, the explanation of why it's a limitation, and the idea of how you could improve it um, and it does say over here, allow, count all or more of the seedlings. Just a little point there. For that selection of seedlings, if you've just written only 20 seedlings selected, um, that's not really getting the point across. It's the fact that there is 20 seedlings selected could be fine, but it's the fact that there is no systematic method for which 20 to get. Okay, it's not the fact that there's only 20. That might be fine if it was randomly, if they were randomly selected. Okay, and then this one, uh, B, one, two, three, is about the degree of bend. So the degree of bending, uh, the idea that comparison is not possible or could be biased, 
but so this this I think I might have got this bending judgment is not quantitative or is subjective open to bias and then measuring the angle of bend would be better another thing always worth a go uh, and I kicking myself I didn't see this as well replicates color in yellow again there were no replicates in this experiment we just used one of each pot so that's not good you can't calculate a mean or identify anomalies maybe one tray I don't know, accidentally got the wrong water. Maybe distilled water wasn't used on one tray. Maybe accidentally acid was used and everything died. Well, that wouldn't be very good, would it? So uh, repeats would be better. Uh, and you could have even said stuff about uh, the size of the Petri dish. Size of Petri dish, not controlled. Different sizes, dish could affect spacing of seeds. Um, specify the size or volume or the diameter of the dish and don't just say use a dish because they should all be the same size because that would affect the density of how the seeds were sort of clustered and that might affect the results. Okay, okay on to question 18. Now this is about gibberellin, a plant hormone, but it falls within the uh, plant and animal responses part uh, of, the, of the course. And this first bit is about drawing a graph. Now I just want to to start by giving you this very important rule if you did not get the marks for this. Um, the thing on the left in the table is normally basically the independent variable, the thing that is being changed. And this always goes on the x-axis, okay? Independent variable always on the x-axis. And the thing on the right is called the dependent variable, and that's the thing that we measure, and that always goes on the y-axis, okay? That's always gonna be the case. And the other thing is, in the table, even though this unit is super annoying and weird, times 10 to the minus three cm cubed kilogram to the minus one day to the minus one, you've still got to write it out, okay? It is a pain, I can, I can see that, but the units are very important and they should always be on your graph, okay? So let's look at the question and see, look at some graphs. Now, uh, I've actually got some example graphs for you here to look at. So here is some material produced by the exam board. Uh, and it's real student work from when this question appeared in 2019. Uh, and this is a four mark graph, okay? This is what it should look like. Why does it get four marks? Well, first of all, the, your X axis is clearly labeled volume of gibberellin applied 10 to the minus three CM3 kg, all that stuff. Okay, there it is. Okay, they didn't write the word applied, but the person has given them that, that mark for, for that x-axis and you also need the y-axis correctly labeled with the units as well for that same mark so this is that's the same mark okay axes axes mark is given so did you get that one the second one is is it 50 percent of the area covered and does it have a linear scale so is the scale does this increment go up here by five each time and this is clear this is a good scale a nice scale and by the way scales should only ever really be uh, well like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.5 or 1 or 2 or 5 or 10 or 20 or 50. You, can you see what I mean? It's multiples. Never 3, please not 3. Um, 4 is annoying as well. Really it's only these ones. Um, okay, it's a line graph. The points are plotted accurately to within plus or minus one small square, and there's a suitable curve, a line of best fit. So it's a line graph, the scale is good, uh, and it's a curve for best fit. Now notice carefully here, let's just zoom in on this person's plot. You see how these points here, this is where the actual points are, but their curve doesn't try and get to all of them. It recognizes that we can do a curve of best fit which kind of approximates those points. Let's look at a couple more examples and you can see where you went wrong. Um, next one, this gets three marks. So what can you spot what's been done wrong here? Have you figured it out? Yeah, it's not a curve. Okay, it's not a curve of best fit. The point's plotted accurately, but this person has done basically a dot to dot kind of thing up here, which has lost them one mark. So that's out of three. Let's look at another one. One mark. So this person has put the axes the wrong way around. So they have the rate of increase over here and the volume over here. So they didn't get the axes mark. The scale is also off, I believe, because this is 0, 0.0. 
and that's 0 0.2. So this space is 0 0.2. But then up here, look what they've done. They've gone 1.8 and 1.9. So that's that's that is a gap of 0 0.2, whereas that is a gap of 0 0.1. Oh, and there's all sorts of madness here. I didn't even spot this one. That's even worse. Yikes. Uh, so yeah, don't do this. Um, your scale needs to be linear like on a ruler. Okay, right. So let's move on. Get back to the paper. Gibraltar causes an increase in internodal length. This is worded quite weirdly, to be honest. Increase in internodal length. Well, here's a picture of um, a plant stem, uh, and the nodes are the kind of you know the kind of the marks up there and sort of down there. And the internodal length means the stem is stretching. So basically, what this is saying is the plant gets taller. So you couldn't just say it makes the plant get taller because it's asking for another role, a different role um, of gibberellins. And I'm going to show you the mark scheme in a minute. In fact, I'll show it right now. So what could you have said? You could have said any of these things. Seed germination. Flowering in long day plants. I think what just flowering would have been good enough. Uh, prevents leave abscission or prevents leave drop. This is kind of the, when they uh, sort of cut off, um, aids stomatal opening, promotes fruit development, not ripening, I'm afraid, because ripening um, is ethene. So not fruit, fruit ripening, but fruit development would have been accepted. Um, hydrolysis of starch or activity of amylase. So, so this is to do with, by the way, just to give a bit more info, this bit is to do with seed germination. They kind of go hand in hand. The seed stores starch and um, enzymes are activated to break it down into sugar, which helps the seed then sort of germinate and grow. The next question you can see right here is about why can we class it as a hormone? Okay, what is really asking you, what is your definition? Do you understand what a hormone is and why what we define a hormone as? Uh, and how can we apply that same definition to animal signaling molecules and plant signaling molecules. So what did you need to say? So things to say, gibberellin is a chemical messenger. Uh, that's the key word there, chemical messenger. And the thing that a lot of my students didn't say is that it's produced in one part of the plant and it can have an action far away in another part of the plant. So for example, auxin is pr produced in the growing leaf tip uh, and it can act further away, can act down the stem. Gibberellin is similar, it's produced in one part and can act further away. Um, then you needed to get something about the, how it affects target cells and or tissues. So target cells and or tissues, maybe it changes the genes that are activated in those tissues or changes the enzyme pr present in those cells or tissues. Um, and the other two things that you may have missed, it can have a long lasting effect or it can have a widespread effect. So the hormone produced in one part of the plant might have an effect in multiple tissues in different places, and the effect might not be instant, and it might in fact last over a, a period of several weeks, for example. Okay, so pause if you need to look at those mark schemes anymore, and we move swiftly on. Question 19. Okay, so I threw this question in there as a, quite a nice, easy content question. This question was testing your content of um, uh, respiration, basically. Do you know the stuff? Uh, if you didn't do well in this question, you need to really revise respiration because this is quite an easy factual based question. Okay, well, let's first of all go through and label all of this stuff. Okay, if, if you didn't, uh, if you couldn't do this, then you should try and do this. So uh, J is ATP and then ADP is produced. Uh, and then this would be um, hexose phosphate. Hexose phosphate. Uh, L over here. Okay, so we this is going to be pyruvate, which means this whole process here is glycolysis. Then this is going to be CO two because when we take pyruvate and we turn it into acetyl CoA or we attach it to coenzyme A as an acetyl group, we lose a carbon dioxide. This part right here, by the way, is the link reaction. And then we have the Krebs cycle here. So in the Krebs cycle, 
uh, we feed in this two carbon acetal group, we attach it to a four carbon thing and we make a six carbon thing uh, and then we break it down. Over here, we are, what is this M? Uh, okay, I think this is CO2 and CO2 again. CO2 and CO2 because it's M, it's the same thing. M is everywhere, so M is always CO2. So this would now be a five carbon thing. And then this over here would be a four carbon thing. And this is a process. This process over here is phosphorylation. ADP is being converted into ATP. But what type of phosphorylation is this? This is substrate level phosphorylation, which is not the same as oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is kind of that fancy process which involves the electron transport chain and ATP synthesis, whereas substrate level is different. More on that later. So I'm going to flip quickly over to the Mark scheme for the next few questions because I've kind of reviewed it already. But... Um, here are the answers. Okay, so that first thing is ATP, and actually, yes, um, it is two molecules of ATP. Glucose is phosphorylated twice, it becomes glucose 6 phosphate, and then it goes to uh, a hexose uh, 1 6 bisphosphate. Here it is, it's actually fructose. Okay, so the actual term for it, if you really want to know, is fructose 1 6 diphosphate uh, or fr fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, sometimes it's called. Um, but we can just call it a hexose. L is pyruvate, M is carbon dioxide. The whole process, which we talked about the whole first stage, is called glycolysis, which, remember, by the way, occurs in the cytosol, not in the mitochondria. Just remember that, cytosol for glycolysis. And process W was substrate phosphorylation. Okay, so this question, question four, asks you to compare how ATP is produced at W um, with how it is produced on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So I'll drop in a little animation of what's going on on the inner mitochondrial membrane over here. And this is quite a complex process. So the two processes that we have are substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. I'll show you the mark scheme in a second. You can get marks for using these ter this terminology but you can also get marks for the detail behind it. So substrate level phosphorylation is really simply having a molecule um, which has a phosphate on it, such as triose phosphate, and then basically just plucking that phosphate off. So the ADP comes along and just takes a phosphate off of triose phosphate to become ATP. So we're dephosphorylating the substrate uh, and, we're, and we're sort of phosphorylating the adenosine diphosphate to make it ATP. So substrate phosphorylation, substrate level phosphorylation is just a chemical reaction, whereas oxidative phosphorylation, as you can see over here, involves the electron transport chain, it involves electron carriers, the pumping of protons into the um, intermembrane space within the mitochondria, uh, and then uh, we generate uh, a gradient, an electrochemical gradient, or you could call it a proton gradient, and then H plus ions flow down ATP synthase, which cause it to spin, and the ATP synthase molecule uh, makes ATP. So there is a big difference there. Uh, and now let's quickly just jump to the Mark scheme so you can see what types of things were accepted. So substrate level is by removing a phosphate from a compound, whereas chemiosmosis, uh, the detail that you could have given uh, electrons pass down electron transport chain, referencing proton gradients, referencing ATP synthase. Sometimes it's called AP ATP synthetase, but I prefer ATP synthase. Um, and you talk about hydrogens being removed from reduced NAD and reduced FAD as well. Okay, so there's lots of detail you could have given there. Pause there if you need to. Okay, so here's question 20. Now this is a uh, kind of experimental methods um, kind of question. And remember, that in the advanced information, they said that you will need to use your practical skills when answering questions about respiration this year. So here's one of those types of questions. So this is all about a respirometer. Uh, and I'm going to include a little clip of a respirometer here so you can kind of see how it's working. Um, and I'll explain, go through the method now. So what the students did was they took 
a small muslin bag of soda lime. And they placed it basically in a syringe. Now you need to remember that this muslin bag of soda lime absorbs CO2. So any CO2 produced by respiring mung beans, this is a mung bean, uh, respiring. So any CO2 produced will be absorbed by that muslin bag and it's kind of trapped in the muslin bag. So this germinating mung bean respiring uses oxygen, which means that the volume or the pressure and the volume of this little compartment of the syringe is decreasing. So the red fluid is drawn in and it will be moving along the capillary tubing like this. So it says they placed a small muslin bag in, then they added five germinating mung beans. That's some inf in interesting information, which we should probably highlight. They were then held in place with a syringe plunger. The students measured the movement of the red fluid in the capillary tube. After each set of readings, the plunger was reset to return the fluid to its original position. Okay, so the question asks, give one limitation of using this method to investigate respiration rate. So a limitation is really a flaw in the experimental design that makes the experiment um, potentially invalid or, or might introduce errors. So what things could be wrong here or could be difficult with this? Well, first of all, the germinating mung bean, it is a bean after all, it might, just might, start photosynthesizing, maybe, which could interfere with the results. If it started photosynthesizing, it would actually be, um, it would be uh, absorbing CO2 as well and it would be producing oxygen, so that could be a problem. Um, it's possible. Um, also, potentially, there might be leaks in this apparatus. We don't know if it's airtight, so potentially, maybe the, the fluid wouldn't be moving at all because sort of air would be sort of leaking in over here. Those are two things that spring to mind uh, straight away. Um, it might be difficult to, to measure the movement of fluid if it's sort of moving. You know, we're look, talking about movements in millimeters here, so it might be tricky to, to, to actually measure the position of the fluid. There's a few more in the mark scheme, which I've had a little look at already. Um, and here they all are, okay? So uh, pause here and look at this. I'm gonna talk you through it. So first of all, we've got this leaky, leaky bit, leakiness. Um, so you can you could have said the seal is not airtight. This is an interesting one. They say that the rate of oxygen uptake may not be a good representation rate. Um, so it might not be exactly sort of an accurate representation. I think what they're getting at is, this doesn't really make much sense the way they've worded this, and I think what they're getting at is this. So the respiratory substrate stored in the seed will affect the oxygen uptake. So for example, if the seed is respiring lipid, um, then more oxygen will be taken up versus than if the seed is respiring carbohydrate. You remember that the, um, what's it called? The respiratory quotient for lipid is like about 0 0.7 and for carbohydrate it's one. So carbohydrate would take in more, uh, would produce a bigger, sorry, lipid would produce a bigger uh, movement because more uh, oxygen would be used up than carbohydrate. Kind of interesting. Uh, a small volume of gas is being measured in the capillary. Measurements only taken every 30 seconds. So maybe we should take it like every five seconds, although I don't think that would really be feasible to be honest and difficulty to read the meniscus. I think if you want to remember two of these that might come up again, this side, this one over here, connectors and this one down here, difficult to read the meniscus, okay? And a leakiness, I think those are probably the, the, the most obvious ones that could come up again. Now, the question then moves on and talks about variables that uh, weren't controlled. Identify one variable that had not been controlled in the experiment and suggest an improvement to control that variable. Well, the most obvious one for me that kind of jumps out is that we've got this thing here of five mung beans. Five beans, that doesn't sound that scientific. How big are the beans? Could we have measured the mass of the beans potentially? Uh, or, or the size, the mass would have been the most, the most obvious thing. So there are a few others in the mark scheme. Uh, let's have a look at them. So first of all, the mass of the seeds is not given. So you get one mark for the variable. And then the improvement is like, how would you control the variable? Well, you would just need to take the mass of the seedlings at the start. 
Um, so you could, you, so you knew that information. Another thing that we don't, we didn't know, is the volume or mass of soda lime is not specified, and potentially we should use a known mass of soda lime each time. Another thing that wasn't specified in the method, just going down a little bit more, is the size of syringe is not given. If we tried to replicate this experiment and we did a different size of syringe, it would affect the rate of movement of the, of the fluid. So we could maybe just use a standard size syringe and you should give a suggested size like a two centimeter cubed syringe. And the final thing is that we just don't even know the capillary tube diameter is not given. So if we tried to repeat this experiment at a different time with a different diameter of capillary tube, we'd get a much different rate of movement per millimeter. So use a capillary tube of length 20 centimeters and a, and a one, one millimeter internal diameter is a suggestion there. Okay, so, oh, oh, finally, this is an obvious one. Sometimes I forget the obvious. Temperature is not controlled. Temperature is not controlled, I'll highlight that in pink. So we should maybe do it at a certain temperature. And if we were to do this at a certain temperature by using a water bath, for example, use of a water bath and thermometer, then we would obviously have to record the temperature. So we'd have to use a thermometer to measure the temperature and kind of let the apparatus reach the right temperature, like leave it in the water bath for a few minutes before we looked at it. I mean, it's a tricky one because the water bath would like go into the capillary tube. So I'm not really sure how you'd have to do this. You probably have it with the capillary tube sticking out of the water bath and just the syringe bit in the water bath. It's a bit of an odd setup, but they have allowed it. Okay, moving on, still thinking about this experiment. Describe how you would add the red fluid to the, to the capillary tube at the start of the experiment. Now, a capillary tube, it works by something called capillary action. It's very similar to actually the xylem vessels, uh, which could be tested this year, uh, in a plant. So basically, if you just put the capillary tube into some red, uh, red liquid, it will just be drawn up by capillary action, okay? So that's what you need to say. Just dip it in some red fluid. I'll show you the mark scheme in just a second. D. The data shows an anomalous result at 60 seconds. Explain why a result is considered to be anomalous and describe one correct way of dealing with this type of result. I'm just going to scroll up and look at that one uh, at 60 seconds. So at 60 seconds here, uh, we can see that this reading, 17.5, is different. So how, how do you describe that it's different? Well, you need to say that it is different from the other readings at 60 seconds, okay? You, if you just say it's different from the other readings, that's a, that's a bit vague and which readings? Do you mean it's different than these readings in this column? No, you have to say it's different than the other readings at 60 seconds. A couple things you could do. Well, you could cross it out and ignore it when calculating the mean, or you could potentially repeat it uh, and record another another value for it. But probably the easiest one is cross it out and don't use it when calculating the mean. So let's look at the mark scheme for those two questions. So dipping it into a small beaker and allowing it to run. So this is what I described earlier. Uh, and then this, this is the anomalous uh, one. So you could have said it is different from the other data at, seven, at 60 seconds. Uh, it does not follow the trend for the for the times for replicate three. Is that true? Let me see that. What does that mean? Oh yeah, that's oh yeah. Okay, so you could have said that. That's uh, twelve. No, I wouldn't have probably said that, but it was given. Um, and what action should you do with it? Well, the action is you uh, exclude it from processing. Who who says that? The anomaly should be excluded from any mean calculations would be fine. Um, or you could have got a mark for say anomaly must be identified but could be included in calculations or repeat to obtain another reading. Yeah, I would best probably would say uh, identify it and exclude it from mean calculations probably is the best way of saying it. Okay, moving on. Using the data the student obtained, calculate the mean rate of respiration for the germinating mung bean between 90 and 150 seconds. Okay, well, let's go up to the data and look at between 90 and 150 seconds. So first of all, let's highlight. So 90 and 150. So first thing we've got to do is we've got to work out the means at these two 
values. Okay, so what's the mean at 90? And what is the mean at 150? Okay, let's do that. So for 90, uh, we've got 31 plus 32 plus 32.5 equals. I always press equals before I divide by 3. And I've got 95.5. Then I divide by 3. So I've got a long number, 31.833. Let's use it to three decimal places when I'm doing my calculation. On the next one, 53 plus 54 plus 53.5 equals 160.5 divided by 3, 53.5. Then we work out the difference between these. So 53.5 minus 31.833. The difference is 21.667 uh, millimeters is how much it's moved. But how many seconds has it moved in between 90 to 150? That is 60 seconds. Yeah, that's 60 seconds. So you could have either given this figure, but I wouldn't give it to this many decimal places as too many. You could have either said it's 21.7 millimeters per minute is fine. Or if you wanted to give it uh, per second, you need to divide it by 60. So divide it by 60. And then you've got 0.36. Uh, millimeters per second or of course you can give these units as uh, millimeters per min to the minus one or millimeters s to the minus one okay let's move on and look at the next question now what additional information would you actually need to calculate the volume of oxygen taken up by the seeds well um, this is kind of a maths requirement thing. If you have a cylinder, you need to know, how do you work out the volume of a cylinder? You need to know the radius, or you could have said the diameter of the tube. We know the length. This is the information we've got, the millimeters that the meniscus has moved down the tubing, but we don't know the radius or diameter to work out the volume. The oxygen uptake for this batch of seeds needs to be compared with data from another type of bean. So what, would, what additional information would be needed to calculate this? Well, if we were doing a different bean, the beans would be a different size. So you're going to need the mass of the seeds. Because then you might do the rate of oxygen uptake per gram of seed. And that would be enable us to, to kind of compare uh, more easily. I'll just jump to the mark scheme for those two points there. So we have 0 0.36 millimeters per second minus one. Uh, you could have had millimeters per second is also acceptable. The internal diameter of the capillary tube. Would they have, it doesn't say whether they've accepted radius or diameter. This is, let's try and focus on that word internal uh, as just another really picky thing that we have to say. Why does that even matter? Well, think about it. If I draw a big cross section of the capillary tube, okay, it's actually going to look a bit like this, right? So what do we need to know? Well, I actually don't want to know the total diameter of it because some of it's glass. I want to know this internal diameter of the capillary tube. So let's try and remember that, and I'll try and remember it if I make a video again. Internal diameter of the capillary tube. The mass of the bean seeds. Right, let's get into this six marker, okay? It says, the group of students wanted to find out if the rate of respiration of a small invertebrate animal was comparable to that of the mung beans. It says, adapt the procedure. This is a command word that I haven't seen very often. Adapt the procedure used uh, to investigate the respiration of a small invertebrate, such as a woodlouse 
or caterpillar with that of the mung beans. Adapt it. Comment on the results you might expect and the conclusions. Comment on the results and the conclusions. So there's two parts. There's a green part and a pink part. Adapt the procedure and then comment on the results and conclusions. Uh, and really, if it's a six marker, we might imagine that there's, you know, three marks available for the adapting and three marks for the results and conclusions. And, you know, whenever you're answering a six marker, I'd probably not go three and three. I'd try and go four and four for safety's sake, because there's not negative marking. So try and say four things about adapting the procedure and four things about the conclusions. Let's get into the MART scheme and then we'll look at some exemplar material. OK, so what does the MART scheme say? Well, uh, this is a bit on two pages of my mark scheme here. It's a bit annoying, but here we go. Describe Level five and six is what we're all going for, right? The top. Describes a clear and detailed experiment that has been effectively adapted for use with chosen invertebrate to allow for the comparison rate of respiration with that of mung beans. Clear and detailed. Uh, and then basically it just says it's written well. Okay, that's level five and six. Well, what if we didn't quite make level five and six? Level three and four is describes an experiment to compare the rate, but it's not very detailed and it may not be perfectly valid. So you've given it a go. And level one and two is an attempt to describe an experiment, um, but little comparison with the mung beans. So basically that's like not very, not very good. Okay, so the mark scheme here divides it up into two sections. The top section here, I'll just scroll down, so this top section here, uh, what color codes did I use? Green and pink. This top section here is stuff that you could have said about the experiment. And this section down here is stuff that you could have said about the conclusions. So let's look at that. Mass of invertebrate and the mass of beans should be the same. Did you say that? Safe and ethical use of invertebrates. So animal cannot touch the muslin bag or you could have talked about um, keeping the soda lime, because you can use soda lime solution, but keeping the soda lime solution away from the um, from, from the little creepy crawlies, the, the, the wood lice, for example. You're going to need a bigger syringe. If you're fitting a wood lice in, it can't really be, you know, uh, one centimetre across. You're going to need to fit a few wood lice in there, so you might need a bigger syringe, something, you know, 5 cm cubed. Temperature constant should, should be... Uh, for the bean and for the invertebrates, the light should be constant. So this is this is a these meth this bit here is about control variables that weren't really stated early on. Um, measure the distance moved by the colored red liquid, and then repeat the experiment multiple times. The results and conclusions that we might expect: um, invertebrate rates of respiration is expected to be higher than the rate of respiration of the beans because invertebrates are moving around uh, and metabolic processes require energy and generates heat. Basically, beans are not moving. Uh, wood lice move and therefore they use more oxygen because they're respiring at a faster rate. They have a higher metabolism. OK, back on this question again, I was just I just paused the video there to try and find some exemplar material but it doesn't exist online because this was from a specimen paper. So I've typed up a little um, model answer for you here on the right. So I think I've pretty much said everything there. That should get a six mark answer if you're looking for um, the type of response that you should write. Um, I didn't. I just read reread my answer and I think I've missed out one or two points. Perhaps you could spot the things that I did miss out. Um, but this this would get six marks because it's a, a detailed description uh, of the experiment and how I would adapt it. Plus, it gives the expected results with an explanation. OK, so there it is. Pause and have a look. And now we're going to move on with the rest of the paper. All right. Here's another question, which is a kind of an easy ish question. It's about photosynthesis, a sort of knowledge recall question. It says photosynthesis involves two main stages, the light in, sorry, the light dependent, which involves photosystems, and the light independent stage, which involves the Calvin cycle. So the primary pigment uh, in photosystems is chlorophyll A. And an accessory pigment could, there's a few, chlorophyll B. We could also have xanthophyll or carotenoids. 
Um, what's the advantage of having a range of accessory pigments? It is that the plant can capture a wider range of wavelengths and the compound that is synthesized in the light dependent stage as a result of the generation of an electrical and pH gradient is ATP. Now you might have said NAD for that, but so why not? Well, it specifically says the generation of an electrical and pH gradient. What's a pH gradient? Well, that is H plus, and it's that H plus gradient that drives ATP synthase. So I'll briefly just go over to the Mart scheme there if you want to double check what you said uh, is allowed, chlorophyll A. Probably the only one that you really want to look at is this bit. Um, the two, two or three different, sorry, one, two, three, four different types of accessory pigment you could have mentioned here. And specifically, what does an accessory pigment do? You have to say wavelengths here. Okay, this is underlined. So able to absorb or use a range of or different wavelengths. I believe that one or two of my students said something like able to absorb different colors of light, which was not credited. Okay, you have to say different wavelengths of light. Don't say colors of light, say wavelengths of light. Let's move on. Here is a chloroplast. Uh, what's what? So A is the inner membrane of the chloroplast envelope. If you really want to get technical, it's the inner membrane of the chloroplast envelope. Um, but chloroplast envelope probably would have been accepted. B is the stroma. And C is a, a stack of thylakoids, or you could call it a, uh, a grana or granum. Let's label. I am of envelope. B is the granum or grana. Uh, and C is the thylakoid stack. What have I done? Sorry, that's wrong. Stroma. Thylakoid stack slash granum. So how is it adapted? Well, it contains tons and tons of photosystems. That's worth a mark. Lots of um, proteins within the electron transport chain. It contains ATP synthase. Uh, it contains lots of um, photosynthetic pigments. All these things were worthy of marks. Okay, let's look at the mark scheme. Uh, where are we? Yeah, here we are. Contain photosystems. This is the, how is it adapted. Contain electron carriers or ATP synthase. Uh, some people did say this in my, my class, it has a large surface area. That's a good one to say. It has a large surface area for light absorption. There's lots of things you could have said about that. So that's, that's the mask in there. Um, yeah, that's it. So pause there if you need to before we move on. Where, where is the part involving carbon dioxide? So this is the light independent part. So it's asking you where is the Calvin cycle happening? And that is in the stroma. Okay, so the answer is just B for that. B. Oops, I like to death, never mind. Okay, so I gave you one easy question on photosynthesis, and now I gave you one harder question on photosynthesis. This is a bit more data interpretation, a bit more challenging. Uh, and actually, I think you had, if you were in my class, you had done this before. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if you remembered it. So it says, explain the shape of the curve for the rate of photosynthesis. I'll show you the mark scheme in a second, but basically, Photosynthesis happens when it's light, okay? There needs to be light. The sun rises sometime around seven and it sets sometime around, by the looks of things here, 4.30. Uh, and photosynthesis happens when it's sunny in the daytime and it reaches a maximum around about noon. Uh, at noon, maximum light intensity, maximum rate of photosynthesis. That's the thing. You'll see in the second in the mark scheme to get that second mark, you had to mention the light dependent reactions or the light dependent stage. You have to give a bit of technical detail. So maximum sunlight uh, equals maximum activity of the light dependent stage. Now this bit here, respiration, it has a bit of a curve, but it's more consistent. Now you didn't actually get marks, it's a bit harsh here, for sort of saying that respiration happens all the time or that it's relatively consistent. What he was asking you for really is why is it curved at all? So why is it curved at all? It's all down to temperature. 
the curve of respiration pretty much follows the expected curve of temperature during the day. Typically, daytime temperatures are kind of highest, you know, around 3 p.m. or so after the sun's been heating up the ground all day. So, um, and respiration is, of course, an enzyme controlled reaction. And as the plant gets warmer throughout the day, the rate of respiration is going to slightly increase because the enzymes are working at a higher temperature. And then as the temperature gets colder, especially after sunset, uh, the, you know, the temperature, the temperature is dropping and the rate of enzymes uh, controlled reactions is dropping. Mark scheme. Here it is. I pretty much talked you through it. So have a little look if you need to. Pause the video here. This was the photosynthesis one. This was the respiration one. And this is actually the mark scheme for the next question. The answer is compensation point. Pause if you need to. And now we're going to move on to the next question. All right, so I said that this is compensation point. I'm not going to go over it much, but L point there and L point there is a compensation point. And what you needed, what you could have said is at the compensation point, the rate of carbohydrate production by photosynthesis is equal to the rate of carbohydrate use by respiration. Okay. All right, moving on to question 24. Okay, so question 24. Uh, is a really classic membrane experiment. And again, they have said in the advanced information that they're going to ask you to kind of use your practical skills when answering questions about membranes. So what jumps to mind is questions about osmosis and potentially membrane permeability, and there's one coming up later. So let's look at this question on uh, potato pieces. We've got discs of potato tuber, tuber tissue in uh, the tube, and we're looking at water potential in potato tuber tissue. Pot <laughs> water, we're looking at water potential in potato tuber tissue. So we've got some sucrose solution, we've got a boiling tube, and we've got discs within that sucrose solution. It says the discs were placed in boiling tubes containing sucrose solutions of different concentrations for four hours. Okay, there's some information, four hours, it might be useful, it might not be, but let's just highlight it. Percentage change of mass was then calculated. The percentage change of mass, okay. Here we have the concentration from zero down to 0 0.45, and here we have the change in mass. State two details of the procedure that must be followed to obtain valid results. Well, to obtain valid results, what things do we have to do? Well, uh, we should cut the discs of potato tuber, tuber tissue uh, to the same size, we should also ensure that if we are looking at those little discs of potato, that some pieces haven't got skin on them, because that will affect the water movement, whereas other pieces don't have skin. They should probably be all be, you should probably peel the potatoes first before you do the discs. Um, and then when you take the discs out to measure their mass, you must blot them dry. Otherwise, you're recording the mass of the water on the disc. So those are three things that I can just think of off the top of my head. Uh, there's probably more. And certainly are. Let's see what other things we could have said. So discs the same size, thickness, surface area. Now, the reason why mass is not accepted. Why? You might have said, why is mass not accepted? Well, because um, it, we're talking about a percentage change in mass. So even if the mass was slightly varying, we're measuring the percentage change. So that, that mass kind of thing is taken off uh, of the cards, it's 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 been dealt with. However, the size would affect the surface area. So if all the discs were like wonky shapes, then the surface area would affect it. So that's why size is, is an issue. I hadn't thought about this. This is an obvious one. Same variety or part of the potato. King Edwards versus, I don't know, whatever, new potatoes. Got to use the same potato. No skin on the potato. Removing excess water. That's the one I was talking about. Reference to blotting or shaking is accepted. Same number of discs. Gosh, I took that for granted. Same number of discs. There's loads. Same volume of solution. It's not specified in the in the image, is it? Um, so, you know, got to use the same volume. Same temperature. Another one. And cover the tubes. I guess so because cover. If you didn't cover the tubes, some water could evaporate out of the tube. 
floating into the air, which would slightly change your sucrose constellation. Uh, constellation? Concentration. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move. Okay, so the next part of the question says, explain how a student could use the data in the table to determine the water potential of the potato tuber, tuber tissue. Okay, so I think a lot of people uh, went with the graphical approach, uh, which was an option and probably the option that I would use. So let me just explain it. Uh, so first of all, you plot the concentration of sucrose solution on the x-axis and then you plot the change in mass on the y-axis. You plot the values and you draw a line of best fit. Okay, so this is conch of sucrose. If I was doing it, well, I wouldn't draw this. You don't draw this, you'd have to describe it, but I'd write it in full. Uh, and this is the percentage change in mass here. You draw a line of best fit, it should be a straight line, and the point at where it crosses the x-axis is the point where you'd expect zero change in mass. And this point at where you'd expect zero change in mass, that point is the point at which the sucrose concentration has the same water potential as the uh, potato cells, okay? And you would expect that that would happen. Looking at the data here, we know that that would happen in this region, okay, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. The final thing that you needed to say, that if you were answering it this way, that pretty much hardly anyone got was, actually, let's say that this value here was at 0 0.25 moles per dm cubed of sucrose. What's the water potential? Is it 0 0.25 moles per dm cubed? No, it's not. Water potential is measured in kilopascals minus something kilopascals. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to look this up in a table or online to convert, to work out what the water potential is. You can look this up, you can plug in online, 0 0.25 moles per dm cubed equals what water potential, and it will come up and it will say something like, I don't know, minus 200 kilopascals or something like that. And hardly anyone have ever said that. There is another way you could do this. If you didn't draw a graph, what you could do is you just recognize that this is the region you need to look at, and you just repeat the experiment with a lot, um, a lot more values. So you try 0 0.2, then you try 0 0.21, 0 0.22, 0 0.23, and so on, up to 0 0.30, and you'd find a more accurate reading for it somewhere in there. But, but really, I think this, the graphical method is better, better. Let's look at the mark scheme for that. Um, it's quite lengthy. Okay, um, pause if you need to. The top bit, it's the, you get one mark for the idea that when there's no change of mass, that is the water potential, okay, the idea. A second mark for talking about the fact that this is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 moles per dm cubed. Look how picky they are. Sometimes it drives me mad how picky the mark marking is available biology, but you have to have the units stated, okay? If you said, oh, it's between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, as you would if you were just speaking, you wouldn't get the mark. You have to say between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 moles per dm cubed. This is the graphical method. You could have got a mark for saying this whole bit here is like a mark, basically talking about the plotting and the, you know, the line of best fit and the x-axis. That's a mark. Uh, this is the um, kind of version where you wouldn't use a graph, but you'd use uh, more intervals. So you could have described this. But again, you have to have, if, you're, if you are talking about 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, you've got to use the units to get the mark. And this is the thing that hardly anyone got. Look up the water potential. You didn't have to say this to get three marks, but it was a mark on the mark scheme because sucrose concentration is not the same thing as water potential. You can look it up on a table. Um, yeah, most people answered it well. Some interesting points there in the mark scheme. Okay, this question, question 25, is another membranes practical question. So this is maybe the other practical that I suspect might be coming up this year. First one, the osmosis potato one. Second one, membrane permeability beetroot. I've shown some pictures here to kind of illustrate it. So betalin is a pigment that is contained within the vacuole in beetroot cells. 
um, betalin or beta cyanin, I guess is another word for it, uh, can leak out if the membrane is disrupted at all. And typical experiments either change temperature or potentially add detergent or ethanol into the, into the mix to kind of disrupt the membrane. So here we are looking at temperature and the students have increased the temperature from zero up to 60. They've done 10 readings each time and they've measured the mean absorbance of some water uh, that the beetroot has been in. It basically just says a colorimeter was used to measure the concentration of purple beetle and pigment that leaked out of the cells when they're exposed to different temperatures. Now you might get asked a lot more detail about this. Typically speaking, they might use um, beetroot discs or cores like this, you can see down here, there's beetroot cores and here I think it's beetroot discs, beetroot discs or cores. Um, just in case this comes up in the future, typically speaking, you make the cores or discs and you have to wash them uh, like three or four times to make sure any beetle and pigment on the surface of the, of the core has kind of been washed away. Wash it three or four times until the water runs clear. Then you put those beetroot discs into some water that is at the required temperature. It could be, it could get to that temperature by using a water bath or, or a Bunsen burner. And you leave the, leave the core in there for a certain time, maybe two minutes. Then you pour off the liquid and you see how much of that purple color has leaked into the liquid. So actually normally when you, when you measure the color, the disc actually shouldn't really be in there, which should have been taken out already. So this actually just asks us to um, work out the T value of this. Calculate the value of T between, between the data for 50 and 60 degrees C. So uh, this has gone a bit funny. So X bar is the mean, S is the standard deviation, N is the number of readings. So let's just do it. T equals, and most of my students did this well, so well done you guys. But if you didn't, this is how you do it. T equals XA minus XB. So uh, let's do 0 0.44 minus 0 0.21. And this here, this means um, the, the size of it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the modulus of it. So it, it doesn't really matter if you do this, take away this, or this, take away this, it's, it's fine. And then we put it all over the square root of, um, so the standard deviation, which is 0 0.06, 0 0.06 squared over 10 plus 0 0.18 squared over 10. Okay, so there it is, it's 0 0.23 divided by the square root of these two very small numbers. Let's add those together, 0 0.06. So that's equal to 3.83, which is the right answer. I'm glad I got there. Uh, yeah, you just got to work through the calculation, but it was worth three marks. So well done if you got this. So moving on, it says the critical value for T at the significance level of 5% with 18 degrees of freedom is 2.10. So uh, basically, do we uh, reject the null hypothesis or accept it? So what you would say is 3.83, is that right? Yeah, 3.83 is bigger than 2.10, therefore we reject the null hypothesis. If your T value is bigger than the critical value, you reject the null hypothesis. And furthermore, you need to go and say, the difference is significant and is not due to chance, okay? Basically, there is a real difference between 50 and 60. It's not just a random fluctuation, it's a real difference between 50 and 60. It's somewhat weird to use the t-test on uh, on this sort of data, but yeah, you, you could, and, and there's definitely a difference. Let's look at the mark scheme in case you're uh, uncertain about the wording of that. Here it is. Reject because the value of t is higher than the critical value, that's the first mark. And the second mark is this, it's significant and not due to chance. The difference is significant and not due to chance. So that would be a perfect answer. I reject the value because the value of t is higher, which means that the difference is significant and not due to chance. Could be error carry forward. If you miscalculated your t 
T value, you could have said, oh, I accept it. And it is due to chance because I got a low T value. The students plotted the data onto a graph. OK, uh, down here, I've copied the same picture again because it kind of illustrates. The student plotted the data onto a graph. Uh, what does it look like? Well, you can kind of see it visually here. The first few, well, these these few look quite similar. And this is a bit pinker. And then these are really pink. And that's kind of what we would expect here. The absorbance, which is really a measure of the pinkness, stays fairly constant. And, you know, just a tiny bit higher, but I would say it's fairly constant up until, you know, above this temperature, above, you know, really till above 30. So I'd say 40 and up is where it starts to really get going. Below 40, there's barely any change. You know, we're talking about a tiny bit. So this question says, describe and explain. So did you do both? Describe is, first of all, saying no change from no real noticeable change from zero to 30. And then explain that. Well, that is because the membrane remains intact. The membrane remain, uh, maintains its integrity and the permeability of the membrane does not change. And then the second part is talking about this whole bit here. So describe is that the absorbance increases uh, a great deal. Maybe you could quote some data. And the explain part is because the membrane becomes more permeable. Um, and I'll go to the mark scheme to show you what you could have said. So on the mark scheme, the picky thing that they're really looking for is the use of the word absorbance. If you didn't say the word absorbance, then you didn't get marks. You might have said something like, as the temperature increases, it increases or it gets pinker or something like that. But that, that's not what they wanted you to say. You had to mention absorbance is underlined. So an increase in pigment increases absorbance. You could have actually got a mark just for explaining why we're seeing an absorbance. If the pigment leaks out, it causes a higher absorbance. This is the describe mark, D2, describe. No change in absorbance underlined. E2, the membrane is still intact or undamaged. This is the explain mark, E for explain. Describe, no change in absorbance. Explain, it's still un intact or undamaged. Uh, and then at the higher temperatures where it starts to ramp up, steep increase in absorbance. And that's because the pigment leaks out. And there's loads of things you could have said. Um, a lot of people were talking about kinetic energy and the phospholipids vibrating backwards and forwards in little tiny gaps. Um, but you could have just said the membrane becomes more permeable or the membrane is damaged or you could have also talked about proteins in the membrane denaturing. Now, one thing to point out, a few people wrote enzymes denaturing. They're not, they're not always enzymes in the membrane. We don't say the membrane, the membrane has lots of enzymes in it. There are lots of proteins. Occasionally there are enzymes, but um, we're not certain that there are enzymes in, in all membranes. So proteins, not, um, not enzymes, please. OK, on to question 26. Uh, question 26 is about uh, loading of sucrose in the phloem. Uh, in companion cells. So I've thrown in a little picture over here, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which kind of um, is the picture behind these observations. But how did we figure this out, this picture on the right? Well, it was based on this investigation. So the scientists investigated and observed three things. First of all, companion cells became slightly negatively charged compared to their surroundings. Observation two, companion cells could decrease the pH of the surrounding solution from 7 to 5.6. Observation 3, the pH inside the companion cells rose from 7 to 8.2. And observation 4, treatment with cyanide prevents the change in pH occurring. Well, let's talk about all those with respect to this picture over here. So observation 1, if this here inside is the companion cell and this over here is um, the solution. Well, basically, the companion cell is going to become negative because it's pumping out protons, uh, pumping them out, which is going to make the cell itself negative. I'm not sure if I like this positive here. The cell itself will become negative because protons are being pumped out of it. Observation two, the pH of the surrounding solution would drop 
if you look at these H plus ions here, the pH of this out external solution would fall because more H plus ions equals a low pH. In here, if we're removing H plus ions, the pH inside the companion cell would increase. So that's observation three. And observation four, if we block the production of ATP, that's here, if we block it with cyanide, so there's no more ATP, then this active transport of H plus will not happen. And this whole um, the loading of sucrose will not occur. OK, so that's kind of uh, the three marks. Let's look at the mark scheme to see what the examiners wanted you to say. So from the first um, first bit, the first observations two and three, basically hydrogen ions are moved out of the cells. Okay, this is you could say this for two marks. Look, hydrogen ions move out of the cell. Two marks. Okay, that's really what I want you to say. Hydrogen ions move out of the cell. One mark for hydrogen. One mark for out of. And then the next part is its active transport. Active transport involves, or you could have just said needs ATP. Okay. All right. On to the next question. OK, here is a potometer. So what have we got? We've got the uh, air water in the meniscus here, capillary tube, water reservoir, leafy shoot, rubber tubing, a potometer. So the question says, a student uses apparatus to investigate the role of stomata in transpiration. The student noted the position of the air water meniscus each minute for five minutes, each minute for five minutes. The student then covered the underside of one of the leaves in petroleum jelly. OK, so we're looking at the underside of the leaf here. Jelly. Petroleum. Petroleum jelly, Vaseline, basically. Okay? Vaseline underneath. And then repeated the measurements. This was continued until all until the undersides of all the leaves had been covered. So this, OK, what they're doing is basically just like kind of selectively taking out leaves. This is a weird experiment. So first they try the whole whole twig with no leaves covered and then they're just like progressively vaselining leaves until they vaselined all the leaves and it's remember it's just the underside of the leaves strange and then they're recording for five minutes this is weird um, and we can basically see that the rate of transpiration has got lower just looking at the data before we kind of really start to think about the question with no petroleum jelly the meniscus moved a total distance of 102 millimetres. And when all the things were covered, it only moved 28 millimetres. So there is a big difference there in the total amount of water lost. Uh, here's the graph. State two different types of information the student has missed from the graph. Well, I think people did this pretty well. Uh, there's loads of things missing. Okay, well, time, we've got no unit. So we want minutes here. Units on the x-axis. And we've also got units on the y-axis, because so units is one thing. Uh, a title would be nice. And we, we've got this sort of legend here, so we know what's what, but we don't actually have the points plotted. We've got no little, you know, little x's like this, which is, I presume what it should look like, be like that. Uh, we need those points for each line. Okay, so those are all the things you could have said. Units, data points, title. I'll show you the mark scheme in a minute. That's basically what you want. Then it says, use the graph to calculate the minimum rate of transpiration. Now, some of you misread this and said and went for maximum. It wants the minimum. So which is the slowest transpiration rate? It's this one here, that one. So how do you calculate the rate of transpiration from this graph? Well, you could basically pick a few different spots. You could pick this spot right here, that data there. And, you know, whenever you're doing a rate, it's the Y change divided by the X change. And in this case, the Y change there at five minutes is 28. And I'd actually probably just go back and look at this. You know, 28 divided by five, you could do. Or if you wanted to, you could do the four minutes and maybe it's 21 divided by four or something like that. Uh, you could pick any point because it's a constant gradient, but probably over here is best. So let's do 28 divided by 5. 
and that should give you the answer. 5.6. Okay, suggest how water is being lost from the cut stem when all the leaves have been treated with petroleum jelly. Well, um, when all the leaves have been covered with petroleum jelly, maybe some water is coming out the top, okay, top of the leaves. So the underside has been covered, but what about the top? Can water exit through the top, through the waxy cuticle, through evaporation? Maybe it can, and that's what the mark scheme was looking for. So I'll show you the mark scheme now. Um, we've already covered this, the, the graph question, uh, this, the, the kind of data question. Anywhere in that is correct. Uh, and but for this two marks, we want evaporation from the upper leaf surfaces. Uh, now, I do think that some leaves have stomata on their upper surfaces, like much far fewer. Um, so I might have been tempted to say there may be stomata on the upper surface of the leaf, which water could escape from. Perhaps I would have only got one mark for that. I'm not sure. Um, OK, the, the next question is about sources of error. Uh, and we're on the mark scheme here, so we might as well just stay on it. But sources of error in the experiment, things that could have gone wrong. Well, perhaps you did the experiment, but you missed a bit. You missed a bit of the bottom of the leaf. You didn't Vaseline the whole thing. There's a little tiny square uncovered. Perhaps there were leaks in the apparatus. It wasn't airtight. Uh, and maybe the chute was not cut underwater. Or you might have just made errors in reading the position of the meniscus. Those are all errors in the experiment. Moving on. Oh, it's the last question. Brilliant. Um, OK, so birds and humans have similar pancreas tissue. So here's some picture of some bird pancreas tissue. Here it is. Um, so the first thing is, what's the islet of Langerhans and what's the asinus? OK, let's go in. Let's zoom in. Uh, the islet of Langerhans is A. You can pretty much, if I draw around the outside of it, you can kind of see that the islet of Langerhans is a kind of circle thing. So that is A, and that's the islet. The asinus may be a little bit more difficult to see, and that is B. What C is, is questionable, but it's some one of those sort of interlobular or intralobular ducts or a, or a vein or an artery or something, some sort of connective tissue, you know, it's that, it's that other stuff. The asini, that's the plural, you know, it would have been nicer if they picked something like that or something, or like, you know, that or something. All these, these things all around here, these are all asini, okay? Asinous cells, those are all asini, and that's B is one of those. By the way, this up here, that's a nice, that's a very squished looking blood vessel, and I can tell it's a blood vessel because it's got all these blood cells in it there. Okay, um, right, the next bit is a um, drawing, okay? I'm going to draw five adjacent cells, annotating them to show visible features. Now, I'll quickly show you what you kind of want to do when you draw this. When you when you draw this, you you almost want to if you if you can trace it, if you are able to trace it in an exam by like taking the printout and putting it under the sheet and kind of looking through it, that's okay. You can do that. You know, no one's going to know. Um, you basically want to. I'm going to try and draw over the top like this. You want to draw clear, continuous lines for each cell, like that. Oh, I think I've gone a bit funny. Uh, and do that for, ah, uh, see, this wouldn't get the mark, because I, well, I am drawing this on a tablet, which makes it a bit difficult. But this is not a clear, continuous line. That's, that's a mistake there, so I'd have to rub that out and try it again. But this is kind of the thing you want to draw. How many cells have I drawn? I've drawn four. And it needs to be recognizable which cells you're drawing. So that would be my drawing. And if I wanted to then uh, lasso select these, so unless I can do this on my, I can copy that, and then I'm going to put it here. There it is. Okay. So that's kind of what you want to look at: clear, continuous lines, almost as if you traced it. Now it needs to be. Um, it needs to follow a few things. Let's look at the mark scheme and then look at some examples. So, what do you need to do to get five marks? You need to have five cells drawn. 
and clear continuous lines. You need to have the cells correct proportions means can you basically tell what cells that you've drawn and some people's tests when i was marking i couldn't tell which five cells you've drawn i didn't know if you'd made them up or if you actually tried to draw accurately so that's one mark using the area 50 percent of the area uh, is a mark and then for the annotations you get one mark for the actual lines drawn with a ruler to the correct feature and it needs to be you know i'm not drawing this with a ruler but a straight line with a ruler you don't want to have an arrow head like that. That loses you the mark. And then the final mark is having labeled. So there's one more, isn't it? The penultimate mark is having labeled not what one, not two, but all three of those things. And then the last mark is any color mention, like darker staining, light staining. So let's pinch in down here and look at this example that the exam has given. So this here gets mark points two, three, and six. So which marks does this person get? Clear continuous lines, they haven't given it because they're a little bit, I guess, faded in places. Correct proportions, yes. You can tell that there are five cells that have actually been drawn. Uh, three, 50% of area, yes. Now label lines, no, because look, they're these little curvy arrows. That's no good. And six, they have, talk about this, nucleus stained dark purple and cytoplasm stained very pale purple. So that's, um, that's an idea. Now, a lot of people did not get marks because the cells were separated by gaps, okay? So if you had, you know, if you had kind of drawn something a little bit like this, uh, I'm gonna draw some, you know, like this, that's not accurate. In actual fact, the cells were basically touching each other, okay? So look at the paper the cells are touching. This is kind of what you need to draw. If you had gaps between the cells, you wouldn't have got it. And a useful point of reference is here, which is the OCR A-Level Biology Biological Drawing Handbook. We can see that this student is drawing this section in the handbook. And this is kind of the thing that we need to go for. Clear continuous lines, label lines straight like this, and the cells are touching. It's okay if lines kind of go over each other uh, or, or like this is also fine. Both these drawings are, are acceptable, um, but we shouldn't have large gaps between them, okay? So the final thing that I'd like you to do if you're not in my class and you're watching this online is you should try and make a table somewhat like this, okay? How did you do in the different areas of the paper? The multiple choice, there were 15 marks. How did you do? What did you get out of 15? Then questions 17 and 18 were all about plant and animal responses. That's the most important thing that's coming up this year. Uh, question 19 and 20 were about respiration and there was a practical component there on question 20. Question 21, 22, 23, those were all about photosynthesis um then we've got to jump down here for some reason i kind of changed the order slightly in my exam but question 24 and 25 were about membranes and the practicals involved how did you do on that 26 and 27 were all about plant transport and 28 was about hormonal communication and remember this is the order in which the marks are coming up so there's most marks for this least marks for this you should write down your ebi areas whether it's content or skills for each of these boxes and then come up with an Easter action plan for what you need to do to address these areas, because remember, these areas are coming up in 2022. I hope you found that useful, and I'll see you next time.